Okay, so I'm here with Abdu, who is in France, works on data science, but is also passionate about literature and philosophy. How did that happen? How did the interest in literature and philosophy first spark? Uh, well, it was philosophy is, um, uh, it's by chance. I, I went into my studies because I wanted to, to study maths and with the curriculum went uh, intensive courses in literature and, and philosophy as well. And um, through amazing teachers, because I think teachers are important, I, I got to, to just love the discipline and understand because good teachers make you understand what it is. And after that, after I finished my studies, I just furthered the readings myself and learned myself. So here I am today, still reading philosophy, but without a teacher anymore. So we're going to talk about Elite on Netflix, Elite, in a moment. But um, we first connected, I think it was over Camille Palio's sexual persona. And you were saying some interesting things about just like reading it from a kind of French perspective, um, how it's different, I guess, for Americans reading it. So just say a little bit what you were saying before about reading Paglia. Well, um, I, I think Paglia is very interesting for French people because uh, she uh, writes a lot about French authors and she writes a lot about authors that French people are proud of, like Balzac, for example, and she mm -hmm. writes about authors who represent the idea of the novel as a universal piece of art that speaks to everybody. And uh, Camille Paglia with her, I, I wouldn't say resentment, but her, with her opposition to uh, uh, those new sexual politics, with new ident identity politics, her, her underscoring of, of the novel and the French novel as a universal type is, I think, very French in a way, mm -hmm. uh, even though today we are much more like you than, than we used to be, you American type. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. what I was saying is that she, it's very surprising that she isn't uh, translated into the French language because of her interest in French people, but also because of, of uh, her um, success worldwide. And because a lot of people do, in France are vocal about the disagreement about the, those new sexual politics that we have today. And I think Paglia can prove an interesting weapon because she talks a lot about sexual persona as a weapon, an intellectual weapon mm -hmm. against this kind of thinking, so. Yeah, and I mean, I was saying how in America, like it's not very cool to say, I mean, at least like in the university setting, like if you mention Paglia in a paper you write, like you're gonna, get canceled it's not um not very politically correct and i was just thinking like because she is so critical like yes like she loves the french decadence um but it's super critical of the post-structuralists which like today in america like this is everything like this is the basis of most university curricula this is what you know pop culture this is kind of the lens we're looking at it through so i think that's why people are hostile to her now. I mean, they even tried to, her students tried to get her fired from her university, but you're saying that that wave is kind of passing in France, that like the post-structuralist thing is like not as viable. French theory is, the French theory is bigger in the US than it is in France. Yeah. Like in France, people don't read Derrida anymore. They don't read Christeva anymore. Like those authors have kind of fallen into oblivion. Whereas in the US, they are still very much relevant. Uh, even Deleuze was huge. He isn't read a lot today besides uh, his introduction to Kant or his intro introduction to Spinoza. And um, yeah, so, and, and, and what stayed uh, basically from the French theory is, is Roland Barthes, but his book, and the most read of his book is a book about love, so nothing mm -hmm. about uh, post-structuralism or whatever. And uh, Foucault, Foucault is still big, but the French people keep coming back to all the philosophers like Sartre or even before Descartes who sells a lot or Spinoza or Kant, the, the classical ones. Basically. Yeah. So do you think if like post-structuralism started to phase out in France after a while, do you think it has the same fate in the US? Like do you think eventually people are going to get tired of it? Um... I, I think because of the construction of our countries, the, the French have this idea of universalism, everyone is the same, etc. Whereas the US has been built on identities and different identities. Basically, the country was built on their citizens and their 
with well, you know, not citizens. Yeah. And and, uh, and the struggle, the American struggle inside the people is very much different than the French. So I think post-structuralism was waiting for a country like the US to mm. exist, you know, in the spring, because those authors with with their they're basically um, uh, I don't know if you can say it in American remettre en question, they're basically questioning everything. Mm -hmm. What is, is this real plant? Is this real flower? But to, to caricature. Yeah. And and sure. and, and uh, because there's so much uh, resentment about the creation of the United States in general, I think post structuralists have found a place to exist because they, it's questioning the whole U US system. That, I, I don't know if I'm clear about it. Yeah. But... Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. No, I, I think like even going back to Descartes, that like that way of thinking that uh skepticism really took off in america because of i don't know i mean as much as like the liberal enlightenment tradition was born in france i think because you guys have more of a, a rich legacy you have a much more extensive history it didn't take root the same way it did in the us which was like founded on these principles you know um, but you were also saying something interesting about like authors like Welbeck, who again, like in the US, his views are kind of politically incorrect. Um, and most people, I was saying, like most people, can you hear me? Yeah. So no, like yeah. I think most people in the US don't really know much about Welbeck, but I, I don't think his views are super viable um, just because of the political correctness but you're saying in france that as much as he's controversial he is respected like people really take him seriously successful he won the goncourt uh he he won the goncourt years after becoming successful when he was already provocative and i think he could gain a lot of traction in the us as well because he speaks of sexual misery that is encountered by a lot of men today and uh, the feeling of uprootness that i think many americans feel Mm. And you were saying it's like, it's, um, it kind of gives voice to people who have suffered from like, the backlash of globalization, where I think in US, like that's not people who do not benefit from certain globalist mm, structures or ideals are systematically silenced, like it's not appropriate to talk about those kinds of people, whereas in France, I guess it's more common to like to consider the plight of people who you know are struggling because of these things it also helps that Wellsbeck's work is a work of fiction and in france we have a, a culture a culture of you know promoting fiction the novel as a piece of fiction i think it's in the us it's i think a lot of people read a lot of non-fiction in mm -hmm. france we have this culture of the novel so expressing those opinions through a novel a history a fiction people who don't really exist um, I think it allowed it to to take the space it has in the in the whole system. For example, it's, if Camille Paglia had written a novel where her, all her ideas were expressed through different characters, it would have, it would have been much less controversial than mm -hmm. the essay yeah. she wrote. Because she, yeah. Yeah. for a novel, it's not really you speaking, it's the characters, even though we know it's Welbeck's opinions, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's also why the backlash is not that big. That's interesting. Yeah, I feel like I mean, Palia's never written fiction, but that would be really exciting if she did. She might be taken more seriously that way. I don't know. I I I don't know. It's very difficult to be a good fiction writer and a good yeah. non-fiction writer. Like for example, John Stigeon's no novels are not really it. Same for Suzanne Sontag, whereas the the essays are, I think, excellent for both. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would you say, have you read much of James Baldwin? Because he did a lot of both. Yes, I, 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 mean, I haven't read everything because you can't read everything, but I'm a big fan of James Baldwin and I read uh, Another Country, which mm -hmm. I bought for many friends and which I think is excellent, excellent in, in many ways. We can speak about it later. It's like, you know, the serious edit in a way, because now that I think of yeah. it, there's like this diverse cast of character and there's the murder at the beginning and sexuality is fluid because you have this gay man sleeping with the mo woman you know it's mm -hmm. everything it's very much elite you know? yes so speaking of let's get into elite so how did you i mean the movie the i'm sorry the series first came out 
was it 2018? I think it, it's like three years ago. I, I, I had no idea. My teenage brother was watching it, but I wasn't. <laughs> it came out uh, 2017, uh, early, early 2018. So how did you first get into it? Uh, confinement. Okay. Uh, I, I don't watch a lot of, of TV series because you have to choose between reading and watching TV series, I think, because there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, but a, a friend of mine, my best friend, actually was watching Elite, and I, and I was mocking her because I thought that was a show for teenagers. My brother, who is 15 year old, watches Elite. And then I started watching, and I just got hooked. I just couldn't stop I, from season one. I, I thought that was, um, I wouldn't say it's so bad, it was brilliant, but uh, I think it, it really showed, and we're going to speak about it later, uh, many things about us. It was more like a mirror of what we want to see and what we believe the world is about than just entertainment, because it's also pure entertainment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I first heard about it because like a lot of young people I know got into it. And the way they were describing it was just very sensationalistic, like, oh, there's murder, there's sex, it's, they're rich, it's really exciting. And I was like, all right, this sounds dumb. But then I said, let me just watch the first episode, also just because it made me nostalgic about Spain, because I miss being there. Um, and I was like, yeah, I mean, it is, it's very exciting, like a lot of suspense and like it's the adrenaline running, but the fact that it just centers around at least the first season about this murder and like pure gratuitous sex scenes that are like pretty raunchy it was just like this has no substance this is kind of dumb but like little by little like if i was bored i'd just watch an episode like maybe every other week and eventually i think it was like the middle of the second season that i was like okay they're actually saying something interesting here about first of all about like the tension between elites and I guess you can say proletarians, working class people, um, but also just about, yeah, like the fluidity, the kind of like moral norms, cultural norms. So then I like, I got into it more and I was like, I left it thinking, yes, like this is really sensational and, um, you know, trying to appeal to the base instinct, but it does have a lot of depth. I don't know how much of it is intentional, but yeah, like there's real substance here. I think a lot of it is intentional. And you know, now that you're speaking of second two, it was, can we spoil it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a spoiler alert. Uh, you know, when, when I saw the incest between um, Lucrecia and her brother, I mm -hmm. thought, okay, she was speaking about norms. There are no norms in this show. Everything is just destroyed by, by the screenwriters. They really don't care. And I think by pushing so far, they give us, such interesting co content they really don't care about what we're going to think or they're just going to push and push the more scandalous the better and um and i think they're doing it much better than some you know elite movies i don't know if you saw the dreamers by bertolucci no i don't see it, it it's a it's an italian movie which is very liked by art house people you know mm -hmm. art house movie people and there's an incest as well that i thought was so badly done so um elitist in a way that it wasn't believable whereas in edit since every norm was shattered from the beginning you know you, you just have to believe it and, and go on yeah mm. and I, I think yeah like the first major theme that's like you know pretty obvious is the class struggle because it's these three kids who receive a scholarship to get into an elite high school um and i mean the the other students are like very blatant about their prejudice like treat them kind of badly make fun of them but also you start to see that um, these elite students have a lot more freedom with in terms of lifestyle and the way they live like they can go to parties they can have sex with whoever they want get drunk and it doesn't really have as many consequences as it does for these lower class students because you know I mean they don't have as many resources it's uh you know also the you you were saying when we were talking before just about like for nadia it's even a bigger drama because you know she's palestinian she's muslim and like she 
is kind of forced to for to kind of let go of her roots of her convictions her traditions in order to be accepted into this kind of elite crowd you know yeah no, she, she's forced you know, i think the nadja guzman story and i hope we speak about it because i think it's the most interesting one actually uh, you know, you have she's forced to to give up her yeah her roots to to insert herself. But what is also very interesting is that through humiliation, Guzman keeps on chasing her. He he also wants to approach. It's not only her that wants to belong. Actually, at the beginning, she's very wary of all this. You know, Western I would say thinking. Mm -hmm. You have Guzman who's trying just to to bring her into his realm. Like when he goes to, to her father's shop and he basically humiliates his father, it's, it's a way of going to her territory. And, and, you know, you have to become like us in a way. For me to love you, you have to stay tr traditional, but also you have to be traditional in the way I want, yeah. which is a kind of modern traditional way. And, uh, and that's a thing I think many people experience today. Like, do we want to approve ourselves or do people approve us you know yeah i mean it's like on one sense what you're saying about how guzman will go over to the the father's sword it's like this kind of implicit colonization of their space of their culture their traditions and it, it also makes you wonder like how much of it is like is his attraction to her a fetish like there's something very exotic about this muslim palestinian girl uh something about breaking the rules you know taking off her hijab um you know so it's like i, I think it's also the fact that you know there's this sense of like oh diversity like we should respect women who want to wear the hijab but when it comes down to their actual beliefs well no you need to conform to the ideals of like western kind of elite culture like you can on um, the we can have the appearance of diversity, but we can't have diversity of thought, diversity of beliefs, because then that creates too much of a conflict. Yeah, totally, totally. But also, m more than a fetish, I think Guzman is pretty much at the beginning of the series, the king of his world, the most popular, the most handsome, blah blah blah, and he goes to Nadia because she comes from such a different world that he cannot impress her. She is not impressed by his, mm -hmm. his standards and why people think he's the best or the most interesting guy that don't apply to her so there's also this chasing in his part i think the, the fetish i think it's also linked to the as you said the colonization of someone who doesn't recognize us like his his, his most potent desire is to be desired by the one who cannot desire mm -hmm. him he wants to conquer her yeah there's a challenge and when she becomes, you know, she, like we saw, it's also for plot reasons, of course, but when she goes to the US and she's like, you know, you see her from New York in her bedroom on her, on her Mac, you know, he loses interest in a way because she just became a girl from his world. And she's not the, the Nadja he wanted to conquer, to conquer from the beginning. Yeah. And like, I also wonder that like the show never really indicates that for her islam is more than just a cultural identity like i mean there are moments where it's like oh you know i'm not supposed to have sex with you i'm not supposed to drink alcohol <laughs> and then that goes out the window pretty quickly so it's i think the producers of the show are even trying to like water down these cultural identities as purely an identity and not yeah. something that like uh, really holds weight for the way we live or the way we see reality like Nadja is much more Muslim culturally than, you know, on, in her personal belief. Like she takes off that as was also so far, you know, because I, I come from Muslim country mm -hmm. and Muslim culture is pretty much my uh, original culture. You see her going to the club and taking off her hijab and it's just the most illogical thing to do for women who wear hijab precisely to avoid the eyes of, of the gaze of men you know she goes to the place where men gazes gaze the most and she takes off her hijab it's just just doesn't make sense and yet we just accept it you know yeah and i i don't know it's like it's going back to the question of the way that the, the lifestyle differences the way they're living it's like the kind of decadence of the elites like there's no um there's this sense that we can live totally without boundaries without roots we can really just do whatever we want. So like, let's say, you know, the threesomes that happen. It's like, if in the moment we decide we want to let someone else into the relationship, we'll just go for it. Um, if I want to have sex with my sister, 
and just go for it. But again, it's like you have to um, only certain people can sustain that lifestyle without the consequences hitting. But it's also they can sustain the lifestyle without when you're rich, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, there are consequences like someone gets murdered, but it's easier for them to clean that up because they have connections. They can, you know, whereas like, for example, Samuel's family you know they have to pay more more seriously like they don't have as much protection the family falls apart um they don't have connection to the police whatever like so i think it's just a bigger commentary on what's going out in like western culture in general right now um but then the other thing i was going to say is like these very spanish themes of like blood knives murder death like you see this all throughout Spanish literature, Spanish art. Um, and I think like just to connect it to Palia, and I guess she she takes this, the concept of like the, um, the dialectic between, the, between Dionysus and Apollo. Um, I guess she gets that from Nietzsche. But you definitely see in Spain, like these themes centering around Dionysus, around, you know, like decadent kind of Bacchanalia, Blood sacrifice. It's totally the Eastern country. Yeah, very much so. So as much as it's like a very modern kind of show, um, you see that it's tapping into the Spanish sensibility of like the blood and the death and all that, which is interesting. I feel like if the show had been, you know, it was a school in America, it would have been totally different. They wouldn't have been as, you know, uh, there would have been much more consequences, you know, for everyone in every action. Whereas in Spain, they're just, you know, just to caricature, living the life, basically it happens and then something else has to happen because they're always, you know, in this Dionysian way of thinking of, you know, just pushing and pushing and doing it again and just enjoying whatever the consequences. Whereas in other countries, it's much more rigid. What you do, you have to pay and you can't do too much. Yeah. And I think in Palio also says this, that like, you see this kind of decadent turn when a culture is in its late phase of collapse. Like anything goes, all the boundaries don't matter. You sleep with whoever. Um, and I just wonder like, are the producers, the creators of the tr show trying to say something that like Western culture is collapsing or are they, I don't know. Like I, what do you think their intention is? Cause I can't totally figure it out. I think the first intention is uh, just like eat its money, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's it's. Uh, I, I think it's. I think the first intention was to create a show that would be binged by many people, mm -hmm. and this is why they keep pushing with many scandal storylines and just you know creating you know for example the fact that um, Guzman's sister had AIDS you know it was just a, a storyline that they just put there and never exploited the fact that Guzman was adopted it's the same but they just keep you know seeding grains. Mm -hmm. in a way yeah, plant they, yeah. they just want things to be scandalous and people to watch but i think the more the show has evolved the more i think their intention was to show how you know everything has become crazy in a way how the uprooting of norms they're just mirroring it in a way because we they, they were serious about in the first in the first season they were serious about the murder and, and the investigation but the more we watch, the, the less we care, actually. It's all about the decadence. And I think they want to show the decadence of the youth today and, uh, and of a certain youth and how it, it corrupts also a, a more proletarian youth. Maybe yeah. Right. How yeah. Because hmm. I'm thinking, like, I think, yeah, it's definitely the main intention is to make money to get viewers. And it, that's why it's so sensationalistic. And again, like it appeal, appeals to these very base level appetites for, for lust, for blood, violence. Um, but yeah, like a lot of, if we want to call them proletarian youth that I know are drawn to the show because it's like, wow, the rich people get to live like this is so cool. And I think it's, I don't know. It's problematic for me that like if you're targeting it to young people especially ones who are not like upper echelons of society you're kind of desensitizing them to the fact that like this is like insanity that this <laughs> it's not sustainable yeah and you're going to create people that are going to be disappointed i, I said that i had a 15 year old brother who watches the series mm -hmm. and everyone in his junior high school does 
But if they think they're going to grow a little older and old and they're going to have all this sex, this is not true. You're not going to have all this sex and all this fun in your life. This is a TV show. And I think for the youth, it's very difficult to, to comprehend. To, to give you a, a parallel, when I was younger uh, in Morocco, we used, and I was his age, 14, 15, we used to watch this TV series called Skins. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. The British one, yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, and it was the same, but with less money, basically. They had all this sex and all this fun. And all of us in Morocco thought, oh, okay, this is like this in the West. And then you arrive and it's like, like this. And people end up frustrated because they expected something that doesn't exist. And you form the children to think about life this way, that it's going to happen this way. It doesn't happen. And it's just, you know, disappointment. But yeah yeah and i think the other interest is that like if you're really trying to appeal to a proletarian crowd like this is all in the interest of actual elites that like if you can desensitize people to what matters most in life to like actually trying to live a dignified life and you distract them with these very instinctive kind of pleasures then you can convince them of anything like you can I don't know. I think especially with like major corporations who are trying to sell certain things to people, like if you're going to get people to live off the level of base instinct and like, yeah, like they're in the palm of your hand now, like they're not going to, um, it just gives more and more power to the elite if the proletarians are desensitized to like all to reality, you know? So I just wonder how much like that was the goal of this show. Um, I, 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 I can't presume the intentions of the producer, but what you say is really interesting because basically what the show uh, sells to this proletarian youth is that they have to integrate into the elite and become like yeah. the elite and do all this, like, it's all about, you know, uprooting their, their working class values and just becoming someone else. And, uh, and I think, as I, I think you said it very correctly, it plays into the hands of big corporations that aim to sell some stuff, you know, like you saw, uh, oh, and we see it in French, and I think it's the same in the US, you have those people who you know come from a working class background, mm -hmm. and they're all about owning a Louis Vuitton bag, having a Gucci belt, and just, you know, showing the signs of wealth, and I think elite, elite plays just into that, to get into the elite, you have to do the same, so they, it's just, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just that. <laughs> yeah, and I also get this sense that the rich students kind of get some kind of sick pleasure out of watching these poor people it's attempting to fit in. And but like the more and more they attempt to fit in and like abandon their roots and their values, their dignity, like um, they have to suffer. They have to pay while the elites get to enjoy and watch the show. Just, um, just Cayetana, she's humiliated and, hum and humiliated throughout the whole season. They watch her trying to be rich and everyone mocks her because she wants to pretend. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is like, I guess it, this is more of an American kind of narrative, but like this, this logic of authenticity, like you have to be true to yourself. You have to be, you know, be who you are, even if society doesn't agree, we shouldn't have these external limits or boundaries imposed on on our personalities and i think like this becomes very interesting when like when the threesome happens and they're in the pool together and then the mom yeah <laughs> and the moms come home and i think this scene where like the moms are like what is this you're a threesome that like that's not normal and then i think it was polo polo was like well people thought you weren't normal when you were lesbian so like who is to say what's normal now so it's like this kind of implicit critique of just like, oh, just be who you are. But like, at what point, like how far can we go with this logic? Or like, you know, the incest between Valerio and Lucrecia, like, you know, it's love. They're in love with each other. Is it good? I mean, who are we to say what's good? Um, I don't know. It's, but it makes you ask that question. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, they, they, they do this while being so young, you know, uh, I think that's also very provocative from the part of the producers because who at 15, well, I'm not 15 anymore, but who at 15 thinks that to spice up their couple, they need to bring another one, you know? And who, yeah. it's, it's just, and, and it's interesting that, you know, as you say, they, they provoke their parents by saying, what are you going to do now? This is how it is now. You were a provocator at your time. Now you're a provoker. 
provocative as well. And I think what's really interesting in Camilla's work, Camilla Paglia's work is, and I think this is why people should read fiction and should read history, is that it's not new. And there's always a cycle of yeah. uh, you're provocative, and then there's conservatives, and then provocation, and then conservatives. What I said to a lot of my fellow friends who say, oh, today uh, it's either too conservative or either too progressive, I say, just look at what happened in the late 60s. People were worse. Like in the 70s, there were like these petitions in France to decriminalize pedophilia. And then what happens? It just comes with the conservative backlash. And this is what yeah. happens with the, happened with the US. You have the 70s and free love and blah, blah, blah. And then Ronald Reagan and the worst, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the worst years, conservatively speaking. So, and I, I think there's going to be a backlash at some point in the same way in TV shows. They're going to go more prude, I think. Yeah. To, to bring back the norms. It's the Apollonian, it's the Apollonian we have in us, you know? Yeah, I mean, that tension is always going to go back and forth. It's inevitable. And it's, it's a motor of history, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't know this. So then like, is there is there a middle ground? Is there a solution? Or is it just to, I mean, I think it's like, we need to just be able to recognize that this is this eternal dialectic. We're always going to be going back and forth. I don't know how much of it is like, oh, let's live in moderation. But I think being conscious of it, not being swept up by the the kind of winds of the times, is probably the most reasonable. I don't know. I think moderation is, is going to come back because, as Kami 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 said, you know, I, I think you know all this sexualization in shows like Elite, they kill eroticism. It's not arousing anymore. It's normal to to see so many people have so much sex, you know, and the eroticism that used to be in some time in history, it has disappeared. And I think people are longing for it. And, you know, as, as, as she said, for desire to exist, there has to be repression in some, in some way. Yeah. So maybe in some time. Yeah. And there has to be like, if sex is just mundane, if it's like the fact that they show these very explicit sex scenes in a way that's very disconnected from the plot, it makes sex into something very just like common is there's nothing um exciting about it other than the fact that sure like it appeals to this base instinct it doesn't have really meaning anymore and i think that's after a while like especially if you're young and you buy into that idea then it's like well who cares anymore yeah no. but yeah totally totally and, and you know going in a country where I, I i think it's the same in some part of the u.s but virginity was is, is a key concept you know having sex with someone is supposed to mean a lot you know mm -hmm. um so you you learn this at home your father and your mother they, they, they taught you this and uh and then you watch tv series like this and, you, and you're like is it really that important there's this tension again is it that important is it or should we just be like the guys in the in the tv series and just destroy it but now that I'm getting older, you know, I, I value a lot of what our parents taught us to repress because you can enjoy, enjoy it all the more when you when you do it, you know. Yeah. Transgression, you know. Transgression is much more exciting than just, it's okay, you can do it whenever you want. Yeah, no, and I think that goes back to this sense that like this elite decadent notion of like a limitless boundaryless lifestyle it's not even that satisfying because like the fact that when you have boundaries when you have certain limits it gives life some excitement there's again there's a sense that transgression transcendence you know um so like the fact that i think they're selling this boundaryless ideal to young people it's like it's a dead end at a certain point they're saying the misery they're just saying the misery yeah so no, but I want to analyze some of the characters a little bit more in depth. So who would you say, who is your favorite to watch? Who do you find most interesting? Um, my favorite to watch is definitely Lucrecia because she has very, uh, I don't think she's the most interesting character, but she has, you know, those one liners that I yes. really appreciate and, uh, and that I, and I used to be in the, in the great movies of the past, you know, they all had the, the snap, she snaps all the time. She's like Betty Davis in, in some ways, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, it was really, really interesting watching her. 
But the most, and, and that's the character I don't really like, but the most interesting character I think is uh, Rebecca right now. It has mm, become yeah, that. okay. Because of, you know, uh, the, she's rich, but it's still a struggle. You know, her mother uh, became rich through drugs. Okay, drugs are bad, blah, blah, blah. But what is interesting and intelligent about the show is that it shows that when you come from a place of so much poverty like her, you have no choice but to go through shady lines to get rich. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you show how conflicted she is about it because she, when, she, when she covers for her mother, you, you, it's like, why, why is the right to be rich like you and to be part of the elite denied to me? You know, your, my mother sells drugs, but Car, uh, Carla's father is as you know, despicable yeah. as yeah. Rebecca's yeah. mother. But it's just that, you know, whereas her, she doesn't have the right because she doesn't belong from the beginning. And this is why I think she's the most interesting character. Her sexuality storyline is not interesting at all, but the rest, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with, okay, so with Lucrecia, I think, yeah, the one-liners are really incredible. She's very, she thinks on her feet, she's very witty, she's sharp, um, can be extremely, what is it? Cleopatra in a way, she's like this androgyne that Camille Paglia speaks yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The masculine qualities of asserting herself while being yes. totally feminine and using her femininity as a weapon. I should... yeah no that's a really good way to to frame it because like she'll stab you she'll backstab you you know she if you cross her she'll destroy you uh like she did to the to the teacher who was trying to adopt the kid like but she uses her sex appeal to lure a man in and like i don't know i do think the end of the third season when she uh and nadia make up and become friends like that to me is just fascinating to see how someone who could be extremely cruel and like mean turns around and like it's not that she's she's not that she loses her passion but she like channels it in another direction so it's like this intensity remains but she recognizes that like loving someone doesn't mean that you lose who you are i don't know it was i was pleasantly surprised by that change um i was disappointed to be honest because really? i saw her very much as a Pagdian character as a like she throws she she's so androgynous androgyn in some way that she throws a reverse valentine's party and you know the moment she, she like like it's, it's like when Camille Paglia speaks of mademoiselle de maupin by theophile Gaultier. The androgyn has no choice. Either he flees to stay unattainable, or he be, he stops being an androgyn. He comes back to the humans. Lucrecia stops being this male assertive woman. She becomes nice and battered, like everyone. Vic I'm a victim of my father, and then she becomes nice and she makes up with Nadia. But that was the only way for her to make up with Nadia to stop being this character that basically was above the others because she ruled the world, she ruled the, the school, and she just stopped being that and. She became the nice, she became a girl. <laughs> Do you think she was being nice though? I don't know if I would say that she was nice. Um, no, she's never really nice. She's always sharp and, and, and sassy in a way. Yeah. But... And I think you can channel that sharpness towards like really, cause it's like, it's not a sentimental, like gentle way of loving Nadia, but it's like, you know, I have your back. Like I'm going to be there for you. It's this kind of, defensive protective kind of affection because she has no choice when she loses the money she has to to be like that when she had the money she could afford to be the meanest bitch there is yeah mm -hmm. i think that we also have to look at that way because the the loss of her father's support was the main uh adverse event that happened to her and uh and the loss of her father's support made the loss of financial support and then she had to struggle just like the others and uh, and the working class students they always had each other's back, whereas the rich one couldn't stop stabbing each other in the back. Yeah. So mm. it's like a leveling in a way, I think. Yeah. So then, what do you make of her and Valerio? Um, her and Valerio. Um, I think it's also part of her the fact that she feels above her world. You know, the fact that she allows herself. To, to, it's like Valeria is totally an androgyne as well. And as Paglia said, only androgyne could like, could love an androgyne, you know, they come together. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that they are so above the others, uh, 
makes them think that they're allowed to, to do that. It's not incest because it's them. The rules don't apply to us, not because we're rich, yeah. but because we're different. We are powerful. We are total humans, not just a man and a woman. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I have this theory about uh, Valerio. And I th- basically, so there's a scene when, I think it's the Halloween party, and they keep mentioning this Oscar Wilde quote. I think it's like, never, never love someone who makes you feel ordinary. And it's something clicked for me. And I was like, this is a Wildean kind of character. And I think it's a commentary on the kind of androgynous nature of Oscar Wilde and his work, because I think Valeria would be this like um, kind of feminine uh performative side of wild because it's like he's not super i don't know like his appearance is kind of androgynous like it's yeah like he's masculine with the hair but he's like this court gesture he's very playful he's always up to some mischief and i think the inverse would be patrick i think patrick represents more of the masculine side of wild um this kind of like constantly pursuing some kind of sexual adventure, the more aggressive side. I don't know. I just, uh, I don't, I highly doubt that their creators were thinking of wild while they created yeah, these characters. But I like, I kept thinking of how Paglia would talk about wild in sexual persona. And, and I think this is why Valerio is a much more potent character than Patrick, for example. You know, every, the new characters are introduced, they, they have a, a very hard time keeping up with the others. You know, Cayetana struggled a lot, not only in the series, but for the viewers mm-hmm. to become interesting and for some people, she never became interesting. And it's the same from the three brothers and sisters. They, they had trouble coming in and a lot of people didn't accept them. I don't think they're all interesting. Where was Valerio? He came, you know, with this aura of, you know, boundary pushing androgynous form and also confidence that can mm-hmm. only be, you know, a conf- not confidence that comes from money, but a confidence that comes from, it's a, it's a very worldly in confidence, yeah. as you said, mm-hmm. because he's pretty and he, he masters both the feminine and the masculine. Everyone accepted him as part of the show. Like, I, I'm sure a lot of people forget he wasn't in season one, you know? Yeah. So, so I, I think you're very on point when you said like he's the wild version, the, the, the feminine wild. And the yeah. feminine wild is the most potent wild. It's not the masculine one. Yeah. And the masculine one is what gets him in trouble because, I mean, him pursuing the sexual relationship with uh, Lord Alfred Douglas, like, ruins his life. Yeah. But do you, but do you, you don't think Patrick is interesting as a character? I think Patrick, you know, you, we, if you followed all these characters who have grown and Patrick, he comes like a bit of, like, he's, he's very much more, he's very much developed sexually, but mm-hmm. he's kind of a newbie sentimentally you know he comes and he thinks he's going just to be loved by uh Ander and Omar blah 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 they are not going to love him and you know us viewers we know because we've grown emotionally with them we became adults with them in a way he comes and he's just a kid trying thinking that because he was watching the in the in the showers once or kissed once he's going to be loved and blah 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 we we know that doesn't work that way they would have worked that way in season one but it doesn't work that way for in season four Mm, I think Patrick's interesting because like he seems to be very conscious of what he's doing with his sexual pursuits because like there's this scene when he's talking to Omar and he's like because you know there was one point in my life when I was bedridden and I couldn't do anything now that I can like I want to live it up until I can anymore like and you sense there's this kind of existential anxiety behind it that's like I want to have the most extreme form of pleasure because like I have this huge desire and if if I can pursue it then I'm just going to go for it because why why settle like why not live out this desire completely um and that's where I think like this kind of wild and decadent um not just that but it's like there's this sense of like sexuality is tied to some ultimate ideal like something transcendent something beyond us so he just wants to go all the way and like break all the taboos like especially like when he's in the club with um what's his name yeah like he gave him like oral sex through his underwear and it's like this is insane but he's conscious of why he's going this far that's why i think it's kind of interesting 
you're, you're so right. I haven't thought about it that way, but now that I hear you speaking, you know, you, you, you spoke about ex an existential struggle within yeah. him. You know, he pushes so much uh, sexually, but we, we, can we can, you know, emphasize with him and, you know, care for him because we also feel the emotional vacuum there is, you know. He has so much sex, but at the end of the day, he just longs to be loved, you know. And uh, his, main, his main struggle in, in season four is to be loved either by Ander or either by Omar, but he does, it doesn't matter, he just wants to be loved. And I think that's the, uh, the other side of his promiscuity and all this unfettered sex. And, and you can have both, I think. This is what, like, I think Omar and, and Ander were, were about to love each other because they didn't enjoy, indulge in this promiscuity and set boundaries that created a refrained desire and allowed them you know, to, to love each other. Patrick is basically uh, the, the he, he, I don't think he, I, I think that the producers, they were very, uh, I think that was intentional. They, they intentionally portrayed a gay man that had a lot of sex because a lot of people think gay men have a lot of sex. And it's true, gay men have a lot of sex. And it's also true that gay men feel very much empty emotionally. I don't know if it's, if it's because of this, of this sex and the, the promiscuity they have, but I think the producers wanted to show the other side of this. Okay, you think that life is great because they can have sex forever and give all sex in nightclubs and blah, blah, blah. But are they really happy? No, they're not. But on the flip side, I feel like Ander and Omar's relationship is a commentary on how like this kind of bourgeois ideal of domesticity, like, oh, let's just be together and be committed forever. Like, first of all, for two men, is that sustainable? But in general, even for like a man and a woman, is that a lasting path to happiness? Because at a certain point, you know, it's not, you're not going to be totally in love anymore. You're going to get frustrated with each other. So it's like either way, these are not total guarantees of happiness, of lasting happiness, at least, you know. So I guess they're juxtaposing these two different ideals. But, you know, coming from Morocco, we never had this passionate vision of, of, of marriage. You know, we all see it as a contract and as a long lasting engagement. We don't see that. Oh, you're so much in love with this one. You should marry. No, you're compatible with this. Your family agrees with that. And it's yeah. also sometimes the the fusion of wealth, the family of the boy and the girl, it is, it's mm. never about that. You know, I, I personally never really saw marriage about being about being about being passionate. It's much more the commitment part and the fact that having a partner helps you stabilize, stabilize your life. It's not fulfillment. Yeah. Like I've, I've grown up with this idea of middle ground. Middle ground is happiness. There is no happiness but middle ground. Yeah, that's very... Uh kind of Aristotelian to say the uh the golden mean but I, I think then now that you're saying that it's like I think the, the show is showing us two sides of western culture that um I mean at the end of the day like at its root it's always based on the individual so whether it's like oh I'm gonna get married because I'm in love and this person makes me feel good and they're gonna fulfill me forever I mean realistically that's not ever gonna happen and this is why there's so much divorce at least in the US. Um, but then the other side is like, oh, I want to chase after pleasure in the moment. But either way, it's about satisfying the individual. It's not about this larger social context or, you know, like marriage, sex, it's all about me. This has been lost in Western culture, you know, in our countries, you know, in our country, in Morocco, all, all, you know, you marry because you have to put some stability, not only for you, but in the community. The, mm. the guy, in the, the first boy in the family has to marry because he has to, fulfill, to, to keep going with the family business, for example, because he has to produce an heir, etc. So it's all about community in, in a small scale, but also in a larger scale. Here in elite and in, in Western culture, you marry to uh, fulfill yourself. There it's you marry to help society stay uh, yeah. Oh. And that's kind of Omar's struggle because that's, I mean, that's what his parents want, you know, being good Palestinian Muslims. But, and then there's this Western kind of individualistic ideal that he's drawn towards. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because I think they're not really showing this non-western narrative for what it is they're just presenting it as like oh they don't want him to be who he is they want to control his life yeah. it's like yeah i mean they could be more accepting of him but at the end of the day 
they have a more realistic vision of his future than like, oh, run off with this guy and be in love. And, and then what? Like, what are you going to have when yeah, that falls off? Introduced, you know, those two views and everything's questioning. Elite wouldn't be elite. They had to stuck with the cliches for the show's work, you know? Uh, otherwise, it, it would have been Omar wouldn't have had the path that he had today, you know? Yeah. And uh, because basically the main uh, evil in, in first season and even season two is Baba, it's the it's yeah. not just father, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and there's no effort from the, the show creators. And I think they do it on purpose to understand why he feels so much hurt, you know? Yes. Yeah, and it's sad to me that like when the father does try to reconcile with Omar, he like, you, they, I think they go out to dinner and like he says, oh, my boyfriend, Minovio, and he's like, he starts to get uncomfortable. And Omar's like, that's it. I knew you didn't accept me. I knew you hated me. If you can't accept that I have a boyfriend and you don't really love me. And it's like, can not you have some sympathy for the fact that your dad is trying to reach out to you? He's that's having a hard time with you having a boyfriend, but like, he has no patience. You know, it's it's like, for seeing things like that. Like exactly. you have, either you, you know, it's. It's like either you accept me the way I tell you to, or nothing at all. And it's like, well, in reality, where does that actually happen? I, I totally agree. And and you know, I I thought they were, they were going on a good path on, because I think the only thing that you know it's a lot like that in Muslim countries. You know, there are gay people in Muslim countries. There's a lot of adulterous affairs in Muslim countries, and people sin a lot. But we have like this policy of don't ask, don't tell. You yes. know, and I think what what Omar was, was what what the father was expecting was Omar to be there and just to shut up about the boyfriend. You know. Yeah, like he knows his son is gay, he, and and I thought the whole you have to accept me, blah blah blah. It's it's a bit stupid because he he accepted him, accepts him. He just doesn't want to know. Yeah, it's like there are certain things you don't talk about with your parents, like in general. Especially in those cultures, you know, in, in in Morocco, like I can't imagine myself sitting with my family and speaking about my feelings. I'm in love with this one, and I'm doing this. One. No one speaks about that, you yeah. know. It's very. <laughs> it's not it's not the culture so and it's also i think if you're going to push it in a macro way a colonization of the personal space in the family yeah. you have to speak about everything because that's the way we do it here it just doesn't work and it didn't work for Omar. <laughs> yeah no. but the other thing i was going to mention about under and um did you watch the the short stories that they had between the seasons i, I didn't watch the new ones Okay, because I think so. There's the one before season four where it's they're in the hospital with Alexis, yeah, and they have this very interesting conversation which becomes like very existentialist. Where he's like, you know, life is random just because, like, don't tell me that like you don't have cancer anymore because you fought to survive, and that if I fight, that I'm gonna be fine. It's like, no, I'm gonna die in two months. Life is random. Life doesn't make any sense. You just have to accept it. And if you get lucky, then live. And it's like, wow, this sounds like I'm reading Camus or Sartre or somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it's interesting that the show has these kinds of moments of depth. Yeah. Still kind of, I mean, to me, it's kind of nihilistic. It's If that's it, then that's kind of sad. But I do think it's cool that they throw those kinds of dialogues in there. I think it's 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 no it's no chance that because in a short story people are not watching Elite for this kind of conversation. I think this is why like the, I think the writers took the opportunity of the short stories to explore more interesting things. Like even the Caroline Samuel episodes, yeah. you could feel that sentiment was much more ambivalent and intelligent than in the, the normal series. It's just like I love you, I don't. There it was more. There was tension basically. And even you know the 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 the, the discussion between uh, on there in the hospital with the with the other guy, there was great potential to uh, it was in a way to show a relationship between two males that could be very intimate intellectually mm -hmm. without them grabbing their with their hands in their pants you know which yeah. is basically for could see that people could connect in a very sentimental way intellectual way without actually physical desire and I thought that was also very interesting. And, and this intimacy can only be reached through intelligent conversations, as you mentioned, you know, mm. get to that by talking about the weather or about, I don't know, whatever gossip there is in the hospital. 
Yeah. Well, for that matter, though, I do find interesting the relationship between Polo, Ander, and Guzman, because, I mean, they are very close friends. Yeah. And there's, I mean, Ander never has sex with Polo, I don't think. No. So, yeah, I mean, that friendship is also interesting because they don't really have yeah. sexual tension. And I think it's great that the screenwriters, when Polo wanted to have sex with a man, he didn't go to, to his token gay friend. He actually experimented with someone else. And I think shows in the past, it was just, it, ha- it just had been, you know, I'm going to have an affair with the closest gay man next to me. Yeah. And, and the fact that Guzman is so at ease, I think it's just a reflection of his ease with sexuating himself in general. He's just, you know, going to accept whatever because he's okay with what he is. Yeah, I mean, Guzman is... Yeah. I think it's interesting how... Um, I mean, we were saying before how he chases after Nadia, but also he is like this very destructive character because when he's angry, like, he's ready to beat someone up and kill them. Like, he's... But he's so just a male, male, you know. He's a male in the old sense of the word, hyper hypersensitive and hyper rough at the same time. And that kind of speaks to Palia's understanding of how like men are weaker than women because it's like we're kind of dumber. We were more instinctive, like because we don't we don't really know how to deal with the conflict until actually we, we resort to violence. And you kind of see it's like as soon as something happens, he snaps and he goes, and it's it's like an animal you know it's like it kind of challenges this elite notion of you know a more tame masculinity he's like this more base yeah, level he's very much human you know he just allows yeah. to be himself he's just like just like uh lucrecia in some way he doesn't care about conventions and you know yeah. not caring about conventions is being this male that would be considered from the past and not a 2022 man mm-hmm. and yeah but it's true that he breaks everything and he basically fails every time. <laughs> but he's a very endearing character. Yeah. Mm. What about Polo? How do you feel about the ending with him? Um, well, I think it was quite botched because they had to do, they had to finish, you know, with the, the because season three is basically the storyline of season one ending, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think he he's the most Baldwinian character in a way. Interesting. <laughs> Because of the way he, his sexuality flows, he just, mm-hmm. you just know, what I think is great about Edith is that just like in the Almodovar movies or in mm-hmm. uh, in some I would say um, Virginia Woolf sometimes you know okay. they never they never just sit down and say oh am I gay am I bi am I whatever yeah. they just live and they just do it and it's just normal like all the all the transsexuals in Almodovar movies you yes. never you never sit and think about why am I transsexual they're just characters yeah. in the lives of the problems. And I really like the fact that Polo, you know, he's just unbothered, you know. And, and, and even the threesome, the problem for his mother wasn't that there was a third guy, a second guy. It was the threesome in itself, not the, is my sexuality different. Mm-hmm. They just all leave it and there's no question about it. And uh, and I, I think that's actually great. And I think and I think he's Baldwinian in that way. Yeah. The, the fact that he kills... Uh, what's Marina. Name again? Marina. Uh, Marina in season one, yeah, I hate her. She's the least interesting one. <laughs> uh, the fact that she that he kills her, you know, it gives him uh, a more consistent plot than the others. Mm-hmm. And I think this is why I see him more as a character from a novel than the other ones who are purely elite, you know. I couldn't see them ev- anywhere else. Whereas Polo, I can imagine, you know, his own story. Mm, yeah, and like when he, I feel like every time he kept lying, about killing her you just hate him more and more because he's such a coward but then like then you see how his mothers are enabling him and it's again it's like this elite sense that like you don't have to pay for anything like you get excused from everything but then at a certain point like he's like no i'm gonna admit it and they want to stop him and you you kind of gain some more respect for him um the way that he dies, I don't know. I, it was kind of funny. I felt bad. For I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, at least it happened in the nightclub because the, let's say the nightclub scenes in Elite are amazing. You know, at, at first I was watching the movie, ju- the the series, just for the party scenes because they're just so great. 
But yeah, he had, he had to die at some point. It was the only way to, to solve the, the equation. It was either that or he's sent to some country like very far away in a private school, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that you're saying about the nightclub is like, it's very Dionysian. It's like, you know, this Bacchanal where there's a blood sacrifice and everyone's Art, drunk. The elite or corner store of the series. Yeah. Like, yeah. I wouldn't watch the series in the world so many parties, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. just so entertaining. And, you know, I I'm 25 and I don't do parties like they do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it makes it more appealing, but. Well, any any last thoughts before we wrap up? Um, well, I think season five is coming out soon. Not yeah. sure. I heard it's coming. Uh, yeah. Um, to be honest, I, I still miss the characters from the beginning, but in a more intellectual way, I, I think everyone should watch it, but should watch it not in a very serious and critical way, because the only way to, I think, size, seize the, the intelligent part of Elite is watching it and a very let it go away. I think that's the only way to to capture the essence of the series that is intelligent but unintentionally. Yeah. What are yours? <laughs> mm. Well, I heard. Uh, I think it was so they they invited Rosalia to be a guest star. Apparently, she said no, which is disappointing. I would have liked to see her, but yeah, I mean, I'm gonna. I already miss Lucrecia. And some of the older characters um but yeah i mean i'm kind of excited to see what happens with patrick and uh ari and mentia and the rest of them i don't know i yeah i mean I, i'm looking forward to it but yeah there will be some people that i miss for sure yeah i agree lucia has left a big hole and i think uh screenwriters instead of, of bringing uh less than Lucrecia, Lucrecia should have created a whole new character with, the, with her own personality, but that's the way it is. Yeah, so we'll see what comes next. But until then, thanks for joining us, Abdul. Thank you. All right.